previous segment, we looked at the theory of Markov chain Monte Carlo. And now it's time to try it out on a couple of examples. This segment and the next segment will be two examples. Let's try it out on a data set that we've seen before. We saw it in segment 31, which was called a tale of model selection. And this is a set of lengths of exons from the human genome. Actually, it's the log of their length. So here we have a peak around 10 to the 2. That's about 100. But we also see something that looks like a second peak here around 10 to the 3, let's say, namely a length about 1,000. And we want to ask if this data is, in fact, described as the sum of two different peaks, what is the ratio of the areas in their peaks? That is to say, how many exons are there in each component? Now, in the human genome, there are many tens of thousands of exons. But here, we're going to make the assumption that for one reason or another, we have only a small data sample. We have only 600 random exons that we have here to look at. They're plotted here as a histogram, but in fact, we're given the actual lengths of each exon. So we have six parameters in the fit. We have two centers for these two distributions. We have two widths, one of them may be from here to here, and the other one, well, it's not too obvious what it is, is it? We have a ratio of the peak heights, the height of this peak to the height of this peak, if they were in isolation. And then, as we saw in segment 31, we have an index for the student t function, which tells how rapidly the tails of the two distributions are supposed to fall off. Since we're doing MCMC, we have to choose a proposal distribution. And we're going to choose a multivariate normal distribution in all six parameters. And a little bit of a trick is, since we already have the maximum likelihood fit and the covariance matrix of this data, we're going to use those as a guide to a reasonable proposal distribution. That is to say, we're going to take steps which are along directions and proportional to the sizes of the covariances along those various directions. Now, we don't want to take a step of the full covariance, because that would be a step of plus or minus one whole standard deviation. We want to take a small multiple of it. So the way this looks in code is we have a starting value of what the param our guess for the parameters. We actually got this from the previous maximum likelihood fit. We have a log likelihood function that we can evaluate for any values of the six parameters. And it will tell us the log of the probability of the data given those parameters. And then here's where we take as a covariance matrix. This is maybe misnamed. It's not the covariance matrix. It's a small number here, 0 0.1 times the covariance matrix, computed, as you see, from the Hessian of the log likelihood function at the location C start. And here is the numerical values that come out of that. These zeros aren't really zeros. They're just small numbers, and they print as zeros. So the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, which sounded very complicated, is really just a very small number of lines of code here. Let's look at what it is. Uh, we're defining a function, Markov chain Monte Carlo step, and it's a function of the set of parameters where we are now, that's C old, and then it's a function of this covariance matrix, this scaled covariance matrix, which is going to define how we make a proposed step. And basically, the proposed step is we simply call a multivariate normal random deviate that has a mean of C old and a covariance of our scaled covariance function. So that takes a little step to a new proposed value of the parameters, C proposed. Now here's the Metropolis-Hastings piece of it, namely the acceptance probability alpha will be the min of 1 and the ratio of the two probabilities. Well, that's the exponential of the difference of the 
two log likelihood functions at the old step and at the new step. And of course this is arranged so that if it's more probable this will be greater than 1 and the step will be always taken. Then finally we draw a random number with probability alpha to see whether we should let the new step be the proposed step or whether the new step should stand pat on the old one. So that's just a review of Metropolis Hastings. Let's see how this does on the first thousand steps. So let's fill in a Markov chain of length a thousand and at each step in the chain we're going to have values for all six parameters in the fit. The first uh, row in the chain is the starting values and now we simply fill in the chain by successive calls to the function mcmc step. Let's plot two components of the chain, the width of the second component of those uh, two peaked functions and the student t index that it's found. Of course we're only plotting two components of the chain here. The chain actually is the joint distribution or samples the joint distribution of all six parameters. Anyway, we see here a chain that wanders around in this space and we know from the theory that if we let this go on for a long time it will fill the distribution ergodically. That is to say it will be in any position in proportion to the Bayes posterior probabilities of those parameters. Well we need more than a thousand steps to see what's going on here so let's try 10,000 steps. Here's exactly the same code but we're going to go and fill in the chain up to 10,000. I'm only going to plot it as dots now not as a chain and you can see that it's filling in something that you can uh, see is a fairly irregular shaped distribution uh, seems to be peaked here but it seems to have a lot of density here it's probably real that there's a structure up here and then a relative gap in here and a structure up here and so on and so forth so okay this is now plausibly ergodic uh, I should probably do a hundred thousand steps instead of ten thousand just to show you but actually MATLAB is too slow for this problem and I'm too lazy to program it in C right now you shouldn't be too lazy. You should program it in a language fast enough to take enough MCMC steps. And there are various ways of checking whether we've converged more rigorously than just looking at the dots on the page. None of them are foolproof, unfortunately. You can look in Numerical Recipes 3rd Edition to find some suggestions and some references. So the payoff now is that we can use this chain of length 10,000 or 100,000 to look at any posterior distribution of any quantity that we want, including any derived quantity or joint distributions of quantities or anything. So as posed in this problem, we were interested in finding the ratio of the areas. And the ratio of the areas we saw in se segment 31 is this combination of the fitted parameters. It's the second parameter divided by the product of the third and the fifth. And let me plot that, the areas, um, against, just to be able to put it into two dimensions, um, some other parameter. The student t index is interesting because that was the last parameter that we added to our model when we were exploring what was a good model or not. Uh, and you get this interesting picture where you see there, although there's a region of favored uh, ratio of areas and student t index, there's actually a bit of a degeneracy, a kind of a valley extending from here along up through here between the student t index and the ratio of areas. With reference back to the segment on model selection, I should comment here that when we were looking from a frequentist viewpoint, we were sort of sweating blood over whether to add parameters to the model. And much of the content of segment 31 was about should we add an extra parameter to the model for this student t index. And we decided eventually that yes, this was a good idea. When people do Markov chain Monte Carlo. Of course they're Bayesians because they're computing posterior Bayes probabilities for parameters and they tend not to sweat these things about should I add a parameter to the model or not. 
what you can do is basically add any number of plausible parameters to the model. And if you can afford the computation of Markov chain Monte Carlo, let Bayes sort it out. If a parameter is useful and going to be localized, then the posterior will be localized within a narrow range of that parameter. If a parameter is irrelevant to the fit, then Bayes will just spread it out to many values, of course, uh, jointly with all the other parameters. And you can just let, in a sense, Bayes take its course. That's an advantage of Markov chain Monte Carlo. I could project this picture down and just look at the single quantity of interest, the ratio of areas. Let's do that and see what we get. We get a histogram, of course, and it seems to have two peaks. Now, we could sample much longer and make these curves smoother, but basically, with this data set, there are really two possible solution regimes that are comparable in likelihood. There's one in which the ratio of areas is fairly small, a value around here, and as we saw on the previous slide, that corresponds also to a student index being fairly high. That would mean sharply falling off tails. And then there's a, another solution regime that has a bit more area in it, so it's a bit more probable that has a reasonably high ratio of areas here, something like 6 maybe. Um, and as we saw on the previous slide, it has a low student t index, that is to say long tails. And the data, this particular data set, allows both. So we've learned much more about our data than would be captured in a, for example, maximum likelihood analysis. The ratio of areas here is actually hard to determine because of these degeneracies with this particular data set of only 600 data points. If we had only known about maximum likelihood and we had found the correct global maximum, we would have decided that the ratio of areas was this. And then if we did the Fisher information matrix, or equivalently Hessian matrix analysis to find what the uncertainty is, uh, we would have probably found the uncertainty just of this peak and decided that we had a pretty well-defined ratio of areas. That would simply be wrong. The actual Bayes posterior, now that we've computed it with MCMC, is much broader than that. And Moreover, the MCMC is informative about these two different regimes in this particular case, or more generally it would be informative, of course, about the whole distribution of the Bayes posterior, and we can do with that information whatever we want.